Hi, welcome. Um, thanks for for joining me here today. I know it's uh, the end of a relatively long day, sitting and listening. So thanks for coming. Hopefully, this will be uh, useful, and you'll learn a little bit of something, and uh, see me me do some code here. So. Who here has ever seen a talk by Josh Long? Is anyone? Oh, wow. Oh, okay. So a lot of you. So he's a fantastic live coder, right? I mean, I've seen him do a 90-minute talk that probably would have taken me like five hours to do, right? He's amazing. I'm not Josh, okay? So bear with me as we, we, we go through some things. I'll do my best. Today I'm going to talk about Spring Cloud Gateway. Um, this is a, an API gateway, a proxy of sorts that uh, typically is used in a, in a microservices type architecture. You have lots of services, you need to be able to find them. Your clients, your external clients need to be able to find them. It's a common pattern. So today I wanted to tell a little bit of a story that and teach you about Gateway in the process of that story. So we have a monolith that we are going to slowly decompose into microservices over the course of, uh, of the talk. So our, our monolith is this amazing piece of technology, right? We have a couple of services and uh, a UI, right? All built and packaged into a single Spring Boot application. Anyone here not familiar with Spring Boot? Sweet. I didn't see, see, I didn't see a single hand. So anyway, so we all know what Spring Boot is. Uh, Spring Cloud is, is built on Spring Boot. Uh, so this, this was the simplest thing for me to do. But none of these services need to be in Java, really, for this to, to all work. Um, so we have two services and a UI. Um, I was very proud of myself. I wrote some JavaScript for this, um, for the front end, which I haven't done in a while. Uh, really, I did. It's right here. So all, all 20, 25 lines of it. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah. Uh, so we make a couple of service calls. Um, our app generates fortunes, right? We tell people's fortunes, that's how we make our money, okay? Uh, most people would call these a legacy application. I like to call it a heritage application. Like I said, it's what, it's what, what, what brings the money in. So, so our money is this guy here, telling fortunes. Not that they know that it's random. But uh, so let's, let's run our monolithic application here and uh, give you a little demo of, of what it looks like. What, what it is that we're going to be migrating. Bring up our, let's see, we're on port 8081. Localhost. Last time I did this, I was sitting. So if, if I do anything wrong, it's because I'm standing this time. So here's our, our fortune application. Hello, Krakow, right? And so we get um, random fortunes every time I do that, okay? So this is our beautiful money-making application that has been running for years and is old and crusty and hard to change, right? We have these new teams that we've spun up that we want to be able to move faster and introduce new features like uppercasing hello and putting quotes around the fortune, you know? Big, big selling features. Maybe we're going to change the color, the background color, because I picked that one just, just special. Um, so we're going to use the gateway to do this. So let's get started. So I have some scaffolding that I've created, just so that it, you don't get bored with all the little details. But I created these applications from uh, a great place on the internet. If you've never been there before, um, this is Spring Initializer. According to Josh, right, this is the second best place on the internet because the first is production, production yes. 
I love production. So I'm doing my best Josh Long, right? I have the shirt, start not, you know, make jar, not war. So all of our, all of our projects are, are executable jars, and we'll be running main methods. So, so I created these ahead of time from, from Initializer. So the first thing we want to do is we're just going to front our old application, right? We're just going to put a proxy in front of it. So here's our gateway. If you want to see the, the palm of the gateway, just to know what some of the dependencies are here. So this is built on a release candidate of our upcoming uh, release, Finchley. And we, the, the important one here for, for this particular feature is the, the gateway starter, OK? So our gateway application is uh, pretty boring, doesn't do anything. So let's go ahead and start defining a route. So in a gateway parlance, this is a, a route that we're going to define. And um, how many people here are familiar with, with Zool from, from Netflix? So a good number of you. And if you've played with the distribution from Spring Cloud, you'll see that this is quite a bit different um, from Zool, and hopefully I'll explain some of those things and how it's a little better to easier to use. So in Zool, the only way really to configure a route was through YAML. You certainly can in the gateway, but there's also a Java DSL and a Kotlin DSL. Uh, I'll be focusing on the, uh, the Java DSL. So you need to create a bean of type route locator. So this is our gateway route locator. Uh, there's a special spring bean called the um, route locator builder that we can use to create our routes. So here is our empty route builder. Is that okay to see or should I make it a little bigger? Is that better? So the first thing we'll do is define a, a route ID. This is the, the monolith. And when you define, Josh has, has been a, a fan of this from early on, and he did a, 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 he did a video on this. And as he was showing it, I was like, oh, that's painful. So I changed it the next day. And so if you try and watch his video, uh, it doesn't work anymore exactly how he did it in the video. So given a, a route, you define some predicates, right? These are things that say, if they match, then we're going to use this route in the filter, right? We'll apply filters to it, and we'll send it to a particular URL that I'll show you. So in this case, we're going to do things based on path, which is similar to how things worked in, in Zool. We're just going to do everything, right? Pretty simple. This is um, using Spring's path matching, right? Kind of ant style paths here. And here's our URI. Localhost 8081. So we're going to go ahead and start our gateway. So one of the things that you'll notice here is that we started, and it tells us the port, but uh, started with Netty, um, not Tomcat or Jetty. The gateway is built on uh, the reactor Netty functionality. So Netty is a non-blocking uh, server that serves various protocols, including HTTP. So um, so it's built on Netty at the moment. There's possibility that we could be able to do it on uh, Tomcat or Jetty, but for now, um, just Netty, which doesn't really matter because all your other services can be in whatever, you know, they can be Tomcat, they can be Jetty, they could be Python, they could be Go. It doesn't really matter. So back to our beautiful application. Change to port 8080. 
Hello, Marcin. There's got to be a Marcin in the audience, isn't there? Maybe one, two. Okay, my coworker here. I'm teasing, um, and that's that's actually a funny quote to have come up with that. So it all works. We've now fronted our application um, and shown just a very basic predicate. So we use uh, Spring 5, which builds on Java 8. So we have the beautiful predicate class from Java, right? And this is all we use um, to determine if a route matches. And uh, the type here we use is a particular one to Spring WebFlex called Server Web Exchange. This gives us access to the HTTP request and response. So basically anything in a request you can use to test, right? So not everything you want to filter or, or route based on path, right? Maybe you want to route based on the host name, for example. Maybe it's a segment in the path and not the whole path. You want to decide that this belongs to this different region, so you're going to send it somewhere else, okay? So there's our gateway application. So these uh, tags here, that means if you go to this GitHub repository and check out a particular tag from, from Git, this will uh, kind of be the stage that, that, that we've just done. So we just did stage one. So moving on, or stage two, excuse me. So let's go ahead and move the UI, okay? Um, where's our monolith? Our beautiful code. We have CSS file, some JavaScript. I'm just going to go ahead and copy that. So in Spring Boot, if you create a folder in your class path called static, it will just serve those static resources out of there, and that's all we're doing. So we're going to do that. Um, oh, I already did it. I better delete that and try again. Okay. <sighs> I must not have cleaned out my... Uh, project perfectly. All right, so here we go. Into resources goes my static folder. Um, awesome. So I've moved, let's see, let's let's change. What should I change here? We'll make it, uh, we'll go the, the hello to italic, right? Can't even spell that. It's right below me. <sighs> oh yeah, style. Oh. What's going on? I must have jet lag. I'll blame it on that. How's that? All right. So we've moved my my UI. I've refactored it. Right. I've changed the style. So now, how do we get? the UI to route to a different service. So we're going to go ahead and create. So because the monolith route is basically a catch-all, anything that comes in will go to the monolith. We're going to put our routes in order above it so that uh, other routes will, will be hit first. So here's our UI. And I'll show you a little bit about uh, we are going to match on no on slash js so we have javascript files or on slash css files and the other one that we actually want to match is the the actual root right um, so we want to, to forward that on to, to the UI. So again, our, our UI, let's see. The UI, if I look at its properties file, it's on port 8082. All right, so let's start up our UI application. Re 
start our gateway. Come back, reload. And so, so you see we're, we're using now the, the, the CSS file from our migrated uh, application. It looks so much better in italic than bold. Thanks for the help. Um, you all get a, a commission about that. So putting a hard-coded URL here isn't really going to scale, right? So maybe we need more than one instance of our UI, but um, how do we do that? In the, in the background, I have running a Eureka server. So Eureka is Netflix service discovery and registration system. And I had already added the proper dependencies to each project um, so that they would register with Eureka. But now I can use that in the gateway and reference a logical service name rather than a uh, physical host and port, okay? So if we come back to the gateway and change this URI, change the scheme to LB, which stands for load balancing, which means in this case it will use um, Ribbon and Eureka's Ribbon integration to locate uh, an instance. And I'm going to use the UI. So where did, where did I get this value from? If we look at, let's close a few of these, the UI's configuration again, you'll see that I've given it the name UI, right? Really uh, uh, awesome name, very flashy. So that's what Eureka, that's what Spring Cloud uses to register in Eureka as the application name, okay? And we can see in Eureka that, that the gateway is registered, the UI is registered, so now we can um, restart the gateway. Make another request from our application. So we have a new So here we can see that the, let's see if I can make that bigger and bring that up a little higher for you, that here we can see Ribbon looking up a list of services and it actually found this host and port and that's the one that we used, right? So if there were multiple hosts in port, it would pick one using one of its the, the algorithms available to it by default round robin, okay? So we've, we've now um, successfully scaled our, our application, um, our UI. So what's next? Let's move on to our name service, okay? This is the uh, greeting, right? Hello. So back to our monolith application. So this is our database that you're looking at here, right? Scales perfectly, right? There's never any downtime with that particular database. So we're going to move um, our hello service out of the monolith this time. So we're doing this one step at a time, right? So this is something that you can do if you were in uh, Marcin's pipeline talk, right? In progressive releases, you could do this so that it wasn't a, a big bang, right? You, didn't, you don't have to eat all the cheese all at once. You can take little nibbles here and there. So if we open our, let's see, greeting, uh, what do I call it? Our hello application, right? So I've already added the appropriate uh, rest controller. So I'm going to be a little uh, 
precocious here and determine that I didn't, you know, using a request parameter is not the right thing to do. I want to make this uh, more restful. So we're going to use a path parameter. Path variable from spring. And uh, then we're going to migrate. So one of the things I'm not going to do here is change the UI, right? So the JavaScript file is still going to send a request to a particular path and with a request parameter. Does that make sense? So I'll, I'll do that to show you a little bit about filters now. So if we create a new route, it says, hello. Uh, the path here is, let me get it right in my JavaScript file, is slash service slash hello. This time, though, we are going to create uh, a filter. There are a bunch of built-in filters, but for now, I'm going to write one um, that So we create our little lambda here. And I will get back to that in just a second. But we need our URI, again, load balanced, slash hello. OK, so if we write our filter here. So this is a, um, a gateway filter. A gateway filter um, is built to mimic the WebFlux filter chain. Um, so we decided to take advantage of many of the pieces from Spring Framework itself. So all the concepts of HTTP, um, the requests, the headers, all of that we have access to. Um, one of the reasons that we didn't go with Zool 2 is because we would have had to, Zool 2 already was not backwards compatible with Zool 1. So there was no upgrade path to begin with, and it had to reinvent a lot of things that, that Spring did. Um, so Gateway is built on, on Spring 5 and Project Reactor. Has anyone, who's heard of Project Reactor? A few of you. So this is uh, Pivotal's uh, reactive programming library. You don't need to know a whole lot about it for this, only that it enables uh, some of the features of the Gateway that weren't available in Zool, like WebSockets, right? Or server sent events, long running connections. Um, also, the, a lot of the things that, that Spring does really well, the path matching um, and things like that that we took advantage of. And so given those, those all of those things, we decided that uh, given our experience creating um, Zool 1 is basically a blank slate. So given our experience of really creating a gateway with, with Zool 1, we decided to take our learning and uh, do something better than we had done with, with Spring Cloud Gateway. OK, so we need to get a request parameter, right? So we get that out of this exchange object, get request, with query parameters. And if I remember correctly, it was called name, okay. So then we need to modify, so this is a pre-filter, right? So this happens before the request is made downstream, right? We need to make it look like to our service that it has a, the, the path that we just created here, right, in, in our hello application. This is what is expecting, but we're going to get a different path from, um, from our application. So we need to rewrite the path, but we need to do a little work to get the, the name out of the query parameter. So we need to change the request. How do we do that? So again, get the request, and much of the Spring Framework 5 uh, is built on some functional programming. Uh, paradigms, and so everything is, is read-only, so we have to call a mutate. Then we can change the path to 
slash hello, hello name. And then we build it. This will return a new request. And then to be a good citizen in a, in a filter chain, we say chain.filter and we pass in the exchange, but the exchange still has the old request, so we have to mutate it as well and pass it our new request. Okay? So now we have mod successfully modified the, uh, the request that will get sent downstream to our new hello application. So let's go ahead and start hello. We'll restart our gateway. So come in Eureka and you can see we have some new, new applications. The gateway started fine. Okay, so now Oh, see, one of the things I wanted to do in the hello application, right, was do some refactoring so, so we know that we're getting the right one. Well, new feature, right, capital hello. You know, we want to yell it. We want to make sure they hear it. So we're going to make it capital. So now, hello world. So, so we successfully rewrote the um, the request. There are various ways built into the to Spring Cloud Gateway to to uh, modify requests, not just writing custom filters like this. But we have a rewrite path filter, which uses regular expressions. We have a set path filter which if you matched against a path with using a, a named path portion, portion like uh, you can do in Spring, then in set path you can reuse that segment again, right? And those segments are placed in uh, a request attribute, so if you want to do something else with them, uh, you can. Let's undo that as it just broke everything. Okay, does that make sense? Everyone with me? Nodding, awesome, perfect. So, how are we doing? Awesome. So, what's next? We've done our UI, we've done service discovery, we've done hello. So, we've noticed that it was, we've made these awesome modifications, right? You know, traffic is, is growing, but our old monolith, uh, isn't handling things very well. So we're going to introduce a uh, circuit breaker to our monolith, right? It's still handling the, the fortunes, right? So let's go ahead and add uh, a circuit breaker to that. So we'll come back here and add route for our fortune. Actually, we can go ahead and add it. I'm going to break script and add it down here. So why duplicate when I already have it? So has anyone heard of Hystrix? So familiar with what a circuit breaker does, right? Just like an electric one, uh, if there's a spike in, in, in traffic, in errors, the circuit will open and uh, will stay open for a certain period of time to allow the downstream service to either recover or restart, whatever you need to. Um, there's various things you can do to configure the circuit breaker. Um, and we'll show you a little, one of the features of the circuit breaker here uh, is that you can create a fallback. So let's go ahead and configure Hystrix. So one of the things, if you've ever used Hystrix before, you can uh, create a fallback that is just a method in your uh, the class that you're that you're using the circuit breaker on, but in a gateway you don't really have method access, right? We're up at an HTTP level. How do you do that? In Zool, we created an interface that is um, a little clunky because you have to interact directly with a, 
an input stream, and so it's not real developer-friendly, to say the least. But uh, here I tried to come up with something that was easy to do, and so I came up with a, a way to just forward a request to a local controller. So the gateway isn't an application, right? It's a library. It's just a Spring Boot application with some functionality. So we can go ahead and add more functionality to a gateway application. So this is a default fortune, right? So now I have to create a request mapping that matches default fortune. And since our, our interface is just a string, it's super easy. That was awesome, right? That's a good fortune. Um, so if we restart the gateway here, and then we have a catastrophic failure with our monolith, right? It goes down. When I come back, the UI is still responsive. They don't see errors. They obviously don't see new fortunes either in this case, but, uh, but you get the point. Um, you can change, you know, the, the value in a fallback doesn't have to be static. It can be dynamic. You could look up some other information from some other source, or, um, you know, if you had a particular algorithm that was doing something, you know, the, the canonical example from Netflix is they, uh, uh, you know, your curated list of suggested, you know, shows to watch. Well, if that's down, they give you a random list. And, and some say that's actually what's happening anyway. But it's beside the point. So, so you can do whatever you want in these, in these fallbacks. And this is a very familiar way to do it, right? It's just a controller. You can do whatever you want here. Um, all right, so we've added our fallback. We want to go ahead and create uh, version two of our fortune service, right? It's making us a lot of money. We want to give developers access to this, right? So let's go ahead and uh, now create a new version of our uh, fortune service. So if I come back to our monolith, right? Let me grab the fortune telling code. Fortune application and pop that in here. I also need my database, right? Database courtesy of Matt Stein. If anyone knows who Matt is, this is his database. Where'd I go? Fortune application. Okay. I missed our magic, right? Magic algorithm. Perfect. So, like I said, we're going to make some upgrades here. Uh, we're going to quote our fortune. And, you know, this is, this is the API version of this. So it's going to be like v2 slash for, fortune. The old one will stay up with the monolith until we, you know, give clients a chance to migrate. So one of the things that, uh, that we want to avoid here is that we don't want any one developer to take down our fortune service, right? So if they're going to create a, a private label version of the fortune application, we don't want them to take us down because we wouldn't be able to serve any of our other customers. So what we're going to do is add um, rate limiting to, to our application and to our gateway. And a, and a gateway is a great place to do that, right? It's a central place where you can apply certain rules to, um, to your whole application. Uh, in fact, I gave this talk last night, and I immediately, create, after listening to someone else talk about their experience with Zool, and I instantly created 
two enhancements to the gateway. So uh, if you're familiar with Spring Boot, you know that there's the actuator, right? This is information about your application, and it's information that you don't want public. And uh, he said, we use a filter to block access to slash actuator on every application. I thought, that's brilliant, right? Developers are dumb and they don't forget to turn it off or they don't forget to put it on a separate port, um, whatever reason. But a gateway is a great place to enforce a rule like that, right? So that no actuator information ever makes it out to the public if, if the gateway is fronting all of your public. Um, so you can do security there. Login security could happen here. You could pass tokens down, you know, if you're using OAuth. Um, lots of different things can happen in this, uh, this particular. The other enhancement was a great one. It was like a, uh, a big red button for a route, right? Say you've, you've released a new thing and there was a critical vulnerability in that route and you just want to just turn it off, right? You want us to stay up behind the, uh, the, the gateway in your infrastructure so you can go see what went wrong. But that would be a great feature for the gateway, right? You go poke an actuator endpoint and disable a route um, immediately. So just a great place for, for these cross-cutting concerns to have applied. Um, some API gateways, there are SaaS versions that exist. Um, Pivotal actually partners with them. They're available on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, one of our uh, coworkers likes to, likes to call them the new uh, ESB. This is where the CTOs like to enforce all the rules and, and the process, and so instead of uh, teams being able to do things themselves, they have to create tickets. And so with something like the gateway, if you're doing DevOps, right, where your teams own the code, the gateway is really just another service, right? It just happens to front the other ones, and so you own it. And so if there needs to be a fix made, you put it through your pipeline and deploy it rather than, than submitting a ticket or relying on, on a third-party service. So let's go ahead and create a new route. This is uh, Fortune V2, right? So our route we match, oh, I already forgotten, slash V2, right? Is that what I called it? V2 Fortune, where are we? Yes, slash V2 slash Fortune. So we're going to go ahead and, and add our, f our filter, our rate limiting filter, request rate limiter. Actually, if you don't mind, if I copy and paste, I know Josh would never do this. So this is just, I don't know, but it's not good live coding, but I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and copy it anyway. And I'll explain it though here, nice. I copied the dot. Okay, so. And then I'm probably missing a parenthesis. Oh. So this goes to our fortune service. Okay. So let's start here. Our Redis rate limiter. So we've had a request for this for a very long time. So request rate limiting in general is not a particular hard problem to solve. Doing distributed rate limiting is a hard problem to solve. As soon as you have more than one gateway and you want to enforce that a particular API key only has so many requests, regardless of which gateway server they happen to go through, now you, you now have to keep state somewhere, right? Um, and I read a, a, a nice blog post um, by a company in the US called Stripe. Has anyone heard of Stripe? 
Okay, a few of you, this is a, it's a very large um, payment processing API company. So they have really nice APIs and client libraries for every language you could think of, and you integrate with them, and uh, you know, money flows from your customers back to you. Um, so pretty important stuff, and they don't want their stuff to be down by someone slamming them. So they've, they've spent a lot of time doing uh, rate limiting. And they used Redis. And I thought that was interesting. Pivotal has a lot of experience. Spring has a lot of experience with, with Redis. So I, and they posted the, the um, Lua script that they use to do the rate limiting. It's actually fairly simple. Um, it uses a uh, algorithm called the token bucket algorithm. If you want to geek out and you like that kind of stuff, go, go find a paper, white paper on it. Um, in short, the configuration here is that every second, one token will be put in the bucket. And those tokens are then available to be consumed by a client. And the burst capacity is how many tokens can the bucket hold? So you could allow, you know, this could be 10 and 50, right? So every second, 10 tokens get in, but if they go unused, the bucket can hold up to 50. And then if you happen to have a spike in traffic, the, they can consume those, those extra tokens. Does that make sense? So it's a lot of times when you think of rate limiting, you think, I'm going to allow 10 requests a second, right? But that's really hard to implement. And so this is a little more flexible algorithm that can be uh, implemented well in a distributed fashion. OK? So there's your little uh, lesson on rate limiting. But it's one of the, the most asked for features, and the gateway is a great place to do it, again, because you can um, apply it. Your developers don't necessarily have to know how to do rate limiting, right? They write a service, and it will be guarded by the gateway. All right. So let's start our Fortune application. Let's start our gateway, restart our gateway. Mm, there it goes, okay. So now I'm gonna come to our, my beautiful now white terminal. That I'm not used to, boy, that's really tall. So we should be able to make a request, so if you've learned nothing today about anything, I want you to learn this one thing, this one tool. So how many of you have heard of curl? Oh, that's a pretty dumb question. Okay. Everybody has, right? So this tool I'm using is called HTTPy. Um, it's curl for humans. Uh, you'll, you'll see why, right? So I'm going to make a request to the gateway. No scheme, no host, it knows, it just assumes localhost. Um, let's see, v2 fortune, right? Um, oh, one of the things I did not talk about here, hey, there, thank you. Um, we need a key, right, to key off, to store in our Redis database, so this would be a user, this could be an API key, it could be a whole application, right? It could be statically set for an application. That way you could limit one of your applications to so much traffic, right? If you have limited capacity across all of your applications. Um, and they can come from anywhere in the request, right? In this case, we're just going to use a header and give it some value, right? This would likely be a token or some login information, it could be an encrypted value in a cookie, whatever it is you're doing for security, you know, um, by default, we use the principal name that is uh, populated by Spring Security, but in this case, we're just going to use a simple header called xfortune key, and so in HTTP, you just name value, right? So this will hopefully work, perfect. So you can see it's the quoted one, so it's the correct one. 
Um, so if I do this, it will just show that it was a, uh, an OK value. And the reason I want to do that is because, like I said, I created a very, very small for demo purposes configuration. And if I hit this as quickly as I can, you'll see that we get basically every other request, we get a 429 back from the, the server uh, for too many requests, right? Make sense? Awesome. That one actually worked today, so I'm happy. <laughs> so there are lots of built-in features to the gateway that, that will make it, let's see if we got through everything here. Yes, we did. And so basically the next step would be you send an email to all your API clients and say, hey, we're migrating to version two. You've got two days. No, you've got three weeks, four months, six months, whatever it is. And then um, after that, you turn off the, the monolith, get rid of the route, and everything's in microservices. And we made it, right? We, we made it, successfully migrated our monolith. Um, some questions I've been asked, well, we're still pointing to a... Uh, a URL here for the, the monolith. Um, you know, if you're on VMs or something, that might not be appropriate. How do we, how do we deal with that? Uh, it kind of depends on your monolith, right? If you can make changes and deploy it easy enough, and you could add a Eureka client to that, maybe that's the answer. Um, if not, maybe you stand up a, a sidecar next to it and let it register the value and send the heartbeats to Eureka. If you're using a different registration system like console, you could just write a config file and point it at, at the instances. Um, so there's, there's different things we can do there. Um, yeah, but that's, that's basically it. We've successfully used the gateway to migrate our monolith. Uh, questions? Yes? Show how we register services in Eureka. Um, it's really boring. Um, you'll see I didn't even add an annotation to this application, right? Basically what I did was add a name and a the appropriate starter. Um, normally you would have to point it at Eureka, but since I'm running on local the default location, uh, I didn't have to do that, so you'd likely need a little more configuration, but uh, it's pretty simple with Spring Cloud. That's, that's what we've tried, tried to do with Spring Cloud, make things that uh, you would do all the time uh, easy. Does that, that work? Any other questions? I know it's it's six o'clock, it's time for dinner, right? <laughs> or drinks, what, you know, whatever the case may be. All right, and if there's no more questions, I'm done. Have a, have a good, good evening.